Part of what we'll be looking at today is going to be um, the cybersecurity implications for um, law firms. Um, it's very easy for um, law firms as an organization not to really see themselves as a, not to really see cybersecurity as a thing, as part of uh, a very important thing to their business. And this important, it is um, misconstrued or may, a, a wrong notion simply because um, often than not, security is often construed as something of um, that probably applies more to some, you know, the bigger industries and the big guys in the industry. And law firms omit the fact that their service provider as playing in the digital space, which means they are as vulnerable as any other organization. So uh, part of what we'll be doing today is um, speak to how law, law firms can actually um, safeguard themselves, um, build security as a culture to ensure the safety of um, their business, their clients, and of course, um, securing um, the bigger space which is really more important because as you might know it's law firms hold one of the most sensitive information if um if you go into regardless of the size of the law firm for example they hold really sensitive information that are so important to businesses from trade secrets to details of really interesting details to people if you understand maybe you've done a divorce case before you know what i'm saying or maybe you've had to talk about administration of estates so these are some of the things we'll be um, looking at. So I guess, Felix, you probably want to talk about um, what are the emerging threats that we have and how it could possibly affect um, law firms. Right. So um, Redon has alluded to some very good cases. Um, so one is that the, the law firms hold a lot of sensitive cases. And by sensitive, sensitive cases, I mean also to come with... Um, Things to do with the amount, the kind of data that you guys are having. You have data that constitutes of high-profile people, um, sensitive data contained uh, for clients, and this is information that we found that most of the time, I know lawyers love lawyers do love um, having papers and files because that is what really lawyers do. But we are moving into a digital space where we are finding that. Most of the time, we are not really moving around with files, but we are moving around with digital um, devices. But now a question comes in, how are we really protecting these digital devices? Because as long as you're connected to your law firm and you're handling this sensitive data, you need to have measures that you need to put in place in order to secure that specific information. But now, um, in as much as you're talking about sensitive information, it's also about We've seen a very high number of cases that uh, bring uh, that are concerning the cyberspace. So, like for example, I'll take an example of what's really happening in the Kenyan industry. Um, we've seen banks, not just in Kenya but across Africa, um, we've seen banks getting hacked, and then the cases all proceed all the way to the litigation process. But then, when we get to the litigation process, um, we meet the lawyers and the judges, and you get to explain a term in Turkey um, that the judge gets to look at you and just wonders what you are saying. So we are at a point where cybersecurity is really, really um, merging together with um, tech, and it, it is up to the lawyers and also up to the techies to make sure that um, you understand both spaces. I was talking with a friend of mine, I've just met her over lunch hour, and um, she, she really tries to merge these two spaces in terms of trying to help the judges understand what happens in the tech, technical space and also help the lawyers understand the technical terms that are there. Um, if you allude to, I'll start with uh, the case that everyone knows, the Donald Trump and versus Russia case, where they say that there was election um, uh, interference by the Russians. Um, it is a digital case because interference did not happen physically, it happened digitally. So there is that one case and then there is also what happened in Kenya in 2017. Um, again, digital interference, but we also of what um, the lawyers were actually discussing uh, at the courts 
um, saying that um, the servers are somewhere in Australia and they are sleeping so we cannot really get access to the data in there. So these are some of the issues that we need to demystify for the lawyers to understand that at the end of it all, it really comes to you as the lawyers, prosecutors and the techies just sitting down and making sure that um, we are on the same table in terms of prosecuting um, cybersecurity um, issues. Yeah. So uh, I think another thing I need to, or another context I need to provide is the fact that, I mean, it's a common saying that um, lawyers are traditionally low adopters of um, technology. So you probably see maybe a lot of traditional firms who still rely on papers and all of that. And um, today we've had an interesting conversation on how much change we're witnessing in um, legal tech. And the truth is, if you continue to deploy um, technology as a tool, for example, then you become um, vulnerable. So it's whether you are hosting your files on cloud or whatever it is you're hosting it, you become um, vulnerable to some of these um, threats that it's out there. So another interesting thing is that um, you see law firms these days providing services um, either around the intersection of privacy and data protection or maybe around the intersection of cybersecurity. And they themselves are actually even omitting deploying necessary controls and necessary organization and technical measures to ensure um, the, their own infrastructure itself is safe. And I'll give you an instance. Um, a couple of years ago, um, DLA Piper is one of the um, one of the one of the most popular global firms that we have. Um, actually, suffered an hack, which actually left them. They couldn't assess any of what they had for uh, for a stretch of time, and that meant a lot for them financially. It meant a lot to them, even from their own reputation and all of that. And that's not the first time. In the U.S., increasingly, will um, if you probably just Google or just uh, don't let me sound like I'm recommending a search engine, but if you just pull up any search engine and just um, law firms that have been hacked, you see a number of cases of law firms who have been victims of um, a data breach. Also, I know we had to work on a particular case in Nigeria in 2018, where one of the big-sized firms, I'm not going to mention the name, was actually, so, uh, actually suffered a data breach where they couldn't assess any of their files. And these are things that have not just um, economic implication on a firm as an organization, it has also reputational implication. And, you know, for some of us, we live in a society where rumor mongering is a thing. So imagine if you have two, three clients saying, oh, don't patronize those people because they can't keep your information safe. You know what that means to your baseline. So when you start having that first client pull out, that second client pull out because they simply can't trust what you're doing with their information. You can't keep their information secure. And also, there is an enormous belief where often than not, we try to see data breach from the perspective of Maybe what we see in Hollywood movies, where you have this guy wearing a hoodie, where he's wearing the glasses, who is breaking into systems and breaking into infrastructures, trying to hack, you know. But in real life, it's not like that. So a data breach could be anything as simple as in a law firm trying to send a file to a, docu um, to a client, a document to a client, a very sensitive one at that, and you send it to a wrong client. That's a data breach. If, for example, we're meant, I'm meant to send an email to everyone in this room, and I'm supposed to do it via using um, the BCC future, for example. And I use um, the CC future, exposing the email of everyone else in this room. That's a data breach. So a data breach could be something as simple as that. And that's why we need to be mindful as law firms, as organizations, whether you run a solo practice or whether you run or you're part of a big practice, where you need to train everyone. That your partner who thinks is old, he needs to be aware because the risk is decentralized. It doesn't make excuse for anyone. So as, as organizations and as, as, as a law firm, we need to take this. It, it has to be some sort of hygiene, the way you probably have your, um, your fire drills, the way you have normal cycle of training. It should be part of even how you onboard um, new, new, new employees and all, and all of that. I'm just putting it out there for us to understand the magnitude of the risk that we also have to contend with playing in the digital space. I mean, we can't continue to push back saying because uh, we're law firms, we're not really so affected, or continue to think or sit in that comfortable place to think we're not part of everything that is happening. These are things that are happening. These are things that are affecting you. These are things that will have real-life consequence on your clients. And this is another way to say it. As a law firm, if you ask for a client, let's say a corporate client or even an individual client, for example, uh, within a data protection remit, you become a processor because it simply means you are taking instruction from the client, who is the controller, telling you what to do with that personal data, for example. So 
By that, it simply means you're a vendor. And now, I don't know if in your experience, locally, maybe I'll push it back to the, um, to the audience, as um, maybe you work in a law firm where maybe you're trying to, especially after the GDPR came into force, where maybe you've had to sign addendum. Is there any lawyer here whose law firm has been asked to sign an addendum to conform with the GDPR, for example, for you to show um, you would be complying with data protection regulation in Europe? Does anyone have that kind of experience here? So you, because you're simply a vendor and putting an addendum in whatever existing retainer that you have, for example, is part of the controller making sure they are putting necessary uh, measures in place such that when anything goes wrong, and especially if it comes from your side, we know how to designate responsibility and obligations. So, Michael, quickly before we take it back to the audience to take some questions, very quickly, what are the things that you think or what are the practices you think law firms can do to make them secure? What are the organizations and technical measures they can put in place to make sure they can keep um, their business running and also safeguard um, the interest of their clients? Just to uh, answer what Ridwan has said and also to add on, um, there are a couple of things that he has mentioned that has really um, sparkled a question in me because I remember for, for, for the hospitals, they have to comply to a certain compliance that needs them to be able to um, protect data, right? Um, for a tech firm, like even if it is a telecom, they have to comply to a certain um, regulation for them to be able to handle data. But my question is, do we have a regulation that says for lawyers that this is what you need to comply to for you to be able to handle cases? Because in as much as you're saying, like for example, the government wanted to collect information, um, the Huduma number issue for Kenya, and we are all on our um, figs going around saying that we don't have a data protection regulation, and we are given that. So in as much as we are uh, putting to, to task the organizations and different governments that are tasked to make sure that our data is safe, we should also put in place as law firms, as, um, yes, as law firms um, uh, ways that we can be able to protect our clients' data. Because if you've realized, nowadays we don't, hackers don't go after systems. They don't go after money, they go after data. And because it has become the new oil of the internet. And if you're not protective of that specific information, then you're um, going to fall as a fatality of a data breach. Now, to ask, uh, to answer what Ridwan has uh, just asked, um, some of the things that we need to do, and it is also a plea to um, the legal fraternity, is we need a lot of training in terms of the cybersecurity space. A lot of training in terms of we need you to understand the techie and also to uh, break uh, in between the law and the tech. Because at the end of it all, um, cybersecurity is wide, technology is wide. We are talking of blockchain. Um, the other day, um, the Ministry of Lands in Kenya was opposing uh, the implementation of blockchain, but now they are on blockchain. Um, nowadays, every legal firm that is out there is talking about blockchain, which is a good thing because by taking our documentation and client's information on blockchain, we are actually bringing along the element of trust and reliability and confidentiality. But now at the end of it all, um, how many lawyers actually get to understand what blockchain is all about? Because yes, you are saying blockchain, 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 but do you understand what blockchain is all about? Um, how about these cases that are being brought to you by banks have been hacked, money has been lost, this is what is there. And Redon was mentioning things like firewalls. Do you have firewalls in your own organization? Do you understand what a firewall is? Now, from there, then we can start having a conversation of, this is what we as a law firm have done to protect our information. Have you also been able to implement the same? Now, from there, a lot of training now, not just the lawyers, um, but also the judges also. Because at the end of it all, the lawyers, you get to understand tech, but now, what happens to the judge? The judge, even if you understand tech in as much as you do, getting to make the judge understand what you understand will be a hectic process. So that is one of the recommendations, training, awareness, so that you can get to appreciate the whole space about cybersecurity.